And welcome to another episode of The Life of David. My name is Jonathan Chan. I'm so glad that you can join me today as we continue our exploration through the first Samuel, second Samuel, and a little bit of first Kings. But before we begin, let us start off with a video clip and we'll be right back. Hey, uh, I need to ask you a big favor. You, you did a reading of my best friend and uh, well, you kind of messed him up. Not a douche. What if I really believe dead people talk to me? Then you're a stupid douche. I think I. Welcome back. Do you have voices in your head that you have conversations with? Voices that tell you whether what you're doing is right or wrong, worthwhile or not, good or bad, etc. Voices that help you quickly rationalize and navigate through decisions that need immediate responses or actions. According to Stan in South Park, he sums up all these voices and identifies them as intuition, or some would say gut feeling. Today, as we continue our journey with the life of David and me, with chapters 23 and 24, we will see what's the difference between intuition and godly intuition. We all have intuition, right? I.e. voices that we have conversations with ourselves, but not all of us may have godly intuition. What is godly intuition, and how do we get it if we want it? Today, we see several examples of the different types of intuition. Let's see which one is the godly one. Let's begin. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 to 29. One day, news came to David that the Philistines were at Keilah, stealing grain from the threshing floors. David asked the Lord, should I go and attack them? Yes, and go, and save Kila, the Lord told him. But David's men said, We're afraid, even here in Judah. We certainly don't want to go to Kila to fight the whole Philistine army. So David asked the Lord again, and again, and again. And again the Lord replied, Go down to Kila, for I will help you conquer the Philistines. So David and his men went to Kila. They slaughtered the Philistines and took all their livestock and rescued the people of Kila. Now, when Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, he brought the ephod with him. Two voices are quickly identified here, one being the Lord's and the other being David's men. How many of us have had opposing voices going on at it in our heads, just like David? One side says, you should go for it. You got this. Give it a shot while another voice in our head says, it's too risky, stay in your comfort zone, it's too dangerous, don't rock the boat. David knows that his men are fully capable of whooping the Philistines' asses, even though his men thought of or otherwise. But David also probably had doubts too, just like us, right? So what does David do? He asks the Lord not once, not twice, not thrice, but many times as the Hebrew verb would imply. This is significant, not about asking the Lord per se, but to decipher whether the voice coming back is from God. For David to ask God so naturally means that he has always been asking God for counsel throughout his life. So, the first step to develop a godly intuition, if you want one, is to ask God for counsel frequently for small things, big things, middle things, little things, insignificant things, everything. Just ask God and have conversations with him often. How do we know if the voice we hear is from God if we don't ask him often? God speaks to us, speaks to each of us differently because we're all different. The message may be the same, but the delivery may be different. David is not afraid or hesitant to ask God frequently and often. That's how he trained his ears to hear God's voice. He knew which voice to follow because he already talks with God often. I know my wife's voice from a crowd of female voices because we talk often. 
hopefully. Relationships need frequent conversations, frequent discussions, frequent questions in order for us to decipher each of our voices. Same with our relationship with God. Let's move on to verse 7. Saul soon learned that David was at Keilah. Good, he exclaimed. We've got him now. God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself in a walled town. So Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Keilah and besiege David and his men. Clearly, Saul has a voice that he listens to that he thinks is from God. But if you've been following along through this series, ever since Saul was anointed as king, Saul never sought after God, never had conversations with God, nor did he listen to those who were God's messengers, for example, Samuel. So how on earth does he know whether the voice in his head is from God? He doesn't. Unfortunately, he equates God's voice with his own, and his own voice is heavily influenced by what he wants, and that is to get after David. This is a good place to give ourselves a warning on how we discern whether the voice is from God or not, whether we have a godly intuition. Is it God who is talking to us, or is it just us talking to ourselves? God provided Saul with enough opportunities to listen to him through Samuel. But Saul ignored Samuel and went with his allies and cronies who supported him. An example of this is coming up, by the way. So having detached himself from God for so long, it's obvious he has no clue how to discern God's voice. For ourselves, do we listen to God's messengers? Do we seek out godly messengers who are devoted to God and have the gift of spiritual discernment so that they can train us, rebuke us, and lead us on how to listen to God for ourselves? And then we develop a godly intuition? Let's move on. Verse 9. But David learned of Saul's plan and told Abiathar the priest to bring the ephod and ask the Lord what he should do. Then David prayed, O Lord God of Israel, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy Keilah because I am here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me to him and will Saul actually come as I have heard? O Lord God of Israel, please tell me. Again, David is seeking God's counsel. It comes naturally for him, doesn't it? And the Lord said he will come. Again, David asked, Will the leaders of Keilah betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, Yes, they will betray you. So David and his men, about 600 of them now, left Keilah and began roaming the countryside. Word soon reached Saul that David had escaped, so he didn't go to Keilah after all. David now stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness and in the hill country of Ziph. Saul hunted him day after day. But, as opposed to what Saul thought, contrary to what Saul thought, God didn't let Saul find him. Remember what Saul said? That, David, that God has handed David over to him? No, he was wrong. God didn't let Saul find him. The second characteristic of godly intuition is this. Sometimes God tells us things that we really don't want to hear and is very inconvenient. For David, he's hoping that Saul is not coming after him and that the reports were not true. But God said, oh yes, he will come. And next, David hoped that the folks he saved from Philistine invasion would not betray him. But God said, oh yes, they will betray you. It's hard to accept voices that completely go against what we hope for, right? It's even harder to accept that those counter voices are from God. Many times I want God to affirm what I want. I want God to affirm me, pat me on the back, tell me to keep going, and encourage me to do stuff that I want to do. The last thing I want God to say to me is, no, don't do it. For David, God told David what David did not want to hear. But for David, because of his deep relationship with God, because of his familiarity with God's voice, his, and familiar with God's character, his deep faith and trust in God. Hearing from God what he didn't want to hear did not faze David. In fact, David just did what was needed to be done after God talked to him, for David had a godly intuition. 
complete trust and willingness to be led by God, even though where God is leading him is into the wilderness. That's godly intuition. In the end, because David trusted God, God didn't let Saul find him. So godly intuition is when God says no to us, it's for our own good, and we follow him. Let's go on to verse 19. But now the men of Ziph went to Saul in Gibeah and betrayed David to him. We know where David is hiding, they said. He is in the strongholds of Horash on the hill of Hekilah, which is in the southern part of Jeshimon. Come down whenever you're ready, O king, and we will catch him and hand him over to you. The Lord bless you, Saul said. At last, someone is concerned about me. Go and check again to be sure of where he is staying and who has seen him there, for I know that he is very crafty. Discover his hiding places and come back when you are sure. Then I'll go with you. And if he is in the area at all, I'll track him down, even if I have to search every hiding place in Judah. So the men of Ziph returned home ahead of Saul. Remember what we said about Saul conflating his own desires with God's voice to the point that his own desires and God's voice are, indistinguish are indistinguishable. It's so hard to pronounce here. Indistinguishable. Here, we have Saul only listening to what he wants to hear. And when he hears what he wants to hear, what did he say? The Lord bless you. And not only that, we know why he said that, because he only cared about himself when he followed up with that statement. At least someone is concerned about me. Or at last, someone is concerned about me. A warning for us, right? When we continue to be concerned about ourselves, Treating God as a mere miracle worker, genie in a bottle, or divine butler to get what we want, we will not be able to distinguish God's voice from our own. And what's worse, we will only listen to those who agree with us or fulfills what we want. Let's continue over to chapter 24, verse 1. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of Engedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds. Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. And just to let you know, this verb is actually to take a dump, you know, doing number two. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you. I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with you with as you wish. Another voice. This time, this voice is from David's men. Though the voice is coming from a different group of people, the message is already going on in David's mind, right? An opportunity here. David's men are just vocalizing the obvious. Here is Saul doing the number two. The irony of being on the throne and doing number two, right? in the same cave where David and his men were hiding. While Saul is alone, in the dark with his pants down, this is a great opportunity to just get rid of Saul, right? Is this opportunity God's will? Is this God's provision for this opportunity? Is this a sign of God telling David to go for it? Is this the pivotal moment where David can now be king? How many of us have encountered opportunities and wonder if it was God's will or provision. How do we know? David's men thought so, but is it? So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. The Lord knows I shouldn't have done that to my lord the king, he said to his men. The Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord, the king, and attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. This uncomfortable feeling that David had. Do you ever wonder how the Holy Spirit works in each of us? The Spirit creates an uncomfortable feeling when, it's, when what we're doing is not according to God's will. Not only that, but the Spirit also provides us with discernment and quote-unquote eyes to see what God sees. Thus far, the author of this passage has described David as a man close to God, a man who trusts God, 
faithful to God and a deep relationship, deep enough for David to know God's character. Because of this, he knew that Saul was God's chosen and still loved by God. Remember that Saul is an Israelite. And so if the Israelites are God's special possession, Saul too is God's special possession. How do we know God's character? How do we develop more of an openness to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's tuggings? Reading and immersing ourselves in Scripture. For in Scripture tells us God's character and allows the Holy Spirit to work in us. Every time we open the Bible, submit ourselves to Scripture, devote our time and energy to read Scripture and immerse it in the words, we gain more understanding of who God is, his character, and also to open ourselves up to submit to the Holy Spirit's tuggings. For in Scripture is where God speaks and where the Holy Spirit works. Every opportunity that comes our way needs to align with God's character or reflect his character. And in order to know that is to read and immerse ourselves in Scripture. That's godly intuition. To be able to decipher whether the opportunity reflects God's character. Like Saul and David, we encounter voices all the time, especially when decisions need to be made or we are faced with challenges or opportunities both in our professional careers and our, prof and our personal lives. There's usually at least two voices, right? One is our own and the other is our interlocutor. David and Saul had both voices. But unlike Saul, David's own voice was greatly influenced by God's voice, who is his second voice. David knew how to discern whether the voices speaking to him were from God or from someone else. How? Well, we learn today that David has a habit of asking God tons of questions, and he ain't afraid to do it. By asking, receiving, asking, and receiving, David trained his ears on how to discern when God responds. We also know that David spends time with God through the chapters we've already explored. And by doing so, he's allowing the Holy Spirit to consume him and providing him with a God perspective on the decisions in front of him or the opportunities in front of him. Look, the time in the wilderness where he spent, the time alone in the stream, if you recall, the time alone in scripture and the time in prayer, you could read it all in the Psalms. When David writes about the law and how he meditates on the law day and night, he spends a lot of time with God in prayer and reading scripture. And so David allows the Holy Spirit to tug him and he allows the, the Holy Spirit to all consume him, to submit to the Holy Spirit's tuggings. Now, not one is more than important than the other, though. These are, just, these are not steps here, though. These should be taken as a whole. All three of these things are important for us to continue to practice daily. And that's how we can have a godly intuition and not be a douche. Amen. Amen.